Yeah, yeah, no, it's the, the rules of rugby. Me? What uh, is you hit another player when the ref is not looking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The first rule of rugby is you can only pass the ball backwards or sideways. All right? From Boston University's Center for Digital Imaging Arts, this is the Post Movie Podcast. I'm Steve Head. And I'm John Black. In this episode, we're going to talk about Clint Eastwood's new movie, Invictus, and me and Orson Welles, Richard Linklater's film. And you're going to try and convince me whether Princess and the Frog is worth a trip to the theater. I'm kind of assuming that... I don't know. I'll, let, I'll leave that up to you. That's right. <laughs> so, me and Orson so, Welles. Let's get into it. Me and Orson Welles. I, I thought it was a fine film. I was really impressed by what Richard Linklater did. I thought he had uh, this whole 19, late 30s ambiance. Even, even the delivery of the actors was like, like right, on, right on. I mean, that was, uh, it was really well done. Something I, I enjoyed it too, but something I was wondering is um, how much background do you think people need about oh, who Austin Wells is? I know young people are going to go because Zac Efron's in it. Zac Efron, yeah. um, and I don't know if they're going to get the Orson Welles stuff. You know, they don't know who he is, unless mm. they're film students who have seen Citizen Kane. And this is about his career on Broadway. So I wondered if you thought it was important for people to maybe read up a little bit or do a little homework before they went to see it, or do you think they'll enjoy just you know, the way I'm it is? You know, I'm thinking that audience is just isn't going to have an interest in... Um, the in Zac Efron it, often, uh, audience? No, not the Zac Efron. I mean, yeah. gonna, I, I just they'll probably see it for this, but... I, I, I'd be curious to see. Uh, I mean, I just look. Okay, here's my opinion. My thought is is that uh, they're not going to see this because like there's a whole generation of kids that are you know wanting to know what Orson Welles is all about. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But but you know, do you think they'll enjoy it anyway, just as a movie going experience? Oh, they will because he's such a character. He's like a, an egotistical titan. Yeah, it's he's fascinating to watch. Watch, and he knew that. He knew that while he was doing this that there was so much gravity about him that. You know, it created its own uh, story. Hey, no kids in this scene. It's a vicious mob. I thought you were out somewhere learning your lines. Oh, I know my lines. Go to the gate. Somebody knocks. Sir, it's your brother, Cassius. Is he alone? No, sir. There are more with him. Not more with him. Mo with him, the plural. This is Shakespearean verse we're speaking. You think you can arbitrarily change the words of the world's greatest playwright because you're not comfortable with them? No, I meant Go words. home and learn your lines. I know my lines. And I say you need mo time. <laughs> Remember, Junior, this tiny scene serves to humanize the entire historical pageant of the play. I did really like this movie. Well, something I'm curious, did you, uh, and I was talking with some other folks before we went in, Zac Efron, I think, is the weak link in this movie. As the wide-eyed kid, you know, who's going to be in theater no matter what. I didn't buy him for a second. It could be one of those things where you don't see him as anything else but Zac Efron. But he is talented. I've only, I've, I haven't seen the High School Musical things. All I've seen is um, Hairspray. But I just didn't, I, I think, and one of the things, I th one of the problems I think is the guy who plays Orson Welles and his name is? Christian McKay. Christian McKay is so overpowering. As Wells was in real life, and I, I know that's the point, but you I wanted to right just on. see him. I when he was off the screen, I was one. I was looking at the scenery. I was looking at the sets. I was looking at Claire Danes. Not really following the story. What a find that guy, Christian McKay. Now has he? I know someone told me he did a Broadway show or an off Broadway show based on Orson Welles. So I'll be curious to see, see what what he's in next. If I, he's any. Yeah, me too. I Anything would be surprised else? that the whole reason this movie was made because he was so dead on. Yeah. As Orson Welles, you, I never, you never thought anything other. I mean, this guy, really, was Orson Welles. Yeah. Is that good? Never what do you think of Claire way. Danes? Um, she's not really pleasant. in it a lot, but. No, no, she's not. But she's she's pleasant. Yeah. I mean, I, I think she's she's she did a fine job. She breaks Zac and, Efron's um, heart, though. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but you know, I I. I I wouldn't say that she like ascends into any like greatness. Nobody does when you're around Orson. Welles right, or right. Kind of, so in a way, everybody except for maybe um, uh, uh, Zac Efron, you know, are kind of just tools in the greater scheme of uh, Orson Welles. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, they they fill out the screen very well. You know, and she does a fine job. But what what didn't really impress me was that. She wasn't, uh, 
<laughs> well, well, maybe this was a good thing. She wasn't so motivated as to you know make this. This wasn't this wasn't like a uh, romantic, you know, comedy thing. There wasn't this romantic thing where she was going to end up with uh, uh, Richard, played by Zac Efron. Right. You know, she right. She had this ultimate goal to meet um, David O. Selznick. David o. Selznick yeah, yes. because he's about yeah. to film, which I think was a nice bit. You know, he's about to film Gone with the Wind. Yeah. You know, which is probably something. Um, it just sets it in a nice time period again with everything else that's going on, mm-hmm. and there are little reminders throughout the um, throughout the film where Wells is reading the Magnificent Ambersons, which is a film he yeah. made later on. The little yeah. touches like that to let you know that where you know gives it a sense of place where the guy is. It's it's sort of like the theatrical birth of the Mercury Theater. Yeah, the yeah. Theater. Who went um, on? They were the same theater that did uh, War of the Worlds, mm-hmm. I think. So. I, I guess maybe it's probably best to do like a, a quick summary. So in this movie, Zac Efron plays Richard, who's a high school kid mm-hmm. who's actually considering not finishing his uh, high school education because he has a chance meeting with um, Claire Danes. Uh, Sonia is her name? Yeah, with a and J, she, not with a Y. She, yeah, with a J, not with a Y. And she introduces him to Orson Welles. So they have this quick sort of audition scene where he's looking for somebody to play the... Uh, what, what in actuality was a ukulele, but uh, I think it was being played like a lute. Oh, yeah, like lute that. during a production um, of Julius Caesar. And Richard floored Orson Welles in this just like, you know, in this 1930s way of auditioning where you're like, he sang the Weedy song. You're cast, you know? Yeah, he sang the Weedy song yeah. for him. And, um, and that's all it took. And so he becomes uh, enchanted by the whole uh, Mercury Theater um, process. So this is about. Orson putting on a play that's going to blow everybody away, Julius Caesar, and everything that goes on all the way up until the curtain rises, and yeah. even after. Well, know. yeah, and it's interesting because, again, it, it's the little details in the movie that I think make it work is that his uh, his Julius Caesar, he cut it down to 90 minutes, mm. and it was done in modern dress. And mm-hmm. you, there are scenes you get to when they're doing the actual performance uh, towards the end of the movie, you can see how shocking it is to an audience at that time because there was a lot of blood that Wells and he did used on stage, and a lot of stuff he did with lighting to make it really violent and present, and you know a big change. That's why it was such a huge and even sort of parallel what was happening in Europe. Right, mm-hmm. right, and it was a very it was a huge phenomenon. You know, not just a, a hit play; it was really changed things at the time. Um, I think they did a good job of recreating it and showing what. Because I think that's important, because they talk about Wells, 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 Wells. But unless we see and get a sense of just that there's a payoff, that he really is, everyone puts up with his shit because he's that good at the end. Mm-hmm. What he does is really worth it. So everyone puts up with his shit. And he, he's not a nice guy. No, you know? he's not. He is charming, but just ultimately disingenuous. And in a way that's so backhandedly mean. Yeah, but and then and then the people around him are left to try and figure him out for themselves. Like, what does this all mean? And then I guess Orson sums it up with, you know, it's all for the greater good of art. And what we're in the business of doing is putting on the be- making the best art we possibly can, and everything else is meaningless. Yeah. So him firing someone on the moment after whatever, even if they've done a good job, you know, it's about you know making great art. But it's also about his gargantuan. Ego, right, right. It's great, and it's it's about making great art, and he is the only judge of what makes art great. Mm. So you see that a lot, where he goes through whether it's, um, because he does. There's a lot of things where you know his voice is so recognizable, and he would do radio shows, Mm. and they they show him taping of a radio broadcast, and he goes in and he ad libs in the middle of the show. Uh, you know, by reading it from the Magnificent Amos, and he just it's reads just out. Like nonchalance, brilliance. Yeah, like yeah. Everybody and and everyone was all... Stuff. And But the thing is, you know, he's such a prick about doing it, but then everyone's uh, impressed because it made it that much better. It's, he knows he's going to work. He's worried about whether everything else is going right. to work. Don't you worry about him. Don't even direct him, because he knows that he's going to deliver. Right. And so you just have to be on your A game, you know, or else... He was bold, he's bold enough to tell people that they're not going to have a future if he fires you. Right, so right. His vengeance is pretty extreme. Which is, again, I think the only, um, my only real problem with the movie was that I liked uh, Christian mm-hmm. so much. I liked the story of Orson Welles so much. I didn't need the story about the young kid, you know, 
the bright-eyed kid from high school getting a part. You know, they use that. Well, what did you think about that recurring subplot with Zoe Kazan as the writer trying to get publishers in the room? I mean, does that meant nothing to me? Meant nothing. And to, and for exposition, is uh, Zac Efron's character Richard mm-hmm. runs into a, a girl at some museum, and she's you know dreams. He dreams of being an actor. She dreams of being a writer. She wants to write for the New Yorker. So there's this little side plot about you know how their dreams come true. Um, despite Orson Welles almost, or, you know, she has no contact with him. But um, I think, again, Christian was so overpowering for me that Mm -hmm. everything else was a distraction, you know, and having um, Zach, you know, scenes of him in his house arguing with his family about he's going to be a star and Mm -hmm. all that, it it was a good enough vehicle to get me into the story. But once once Orson Welles' character came on screen, I wasn't interested in anything else, and any everything else was a distraction to me. Hmm. You know, Orson Welles' relationship with the Ben Chaplin character, George, mm-hmm. before he gets the shower, he, he was terrific, especially the meltdown scene. Yeah, where yeah. What Orson does is Orson inspires you. And he may be even playing a trick on his actors. He may be giving them... He may, you know, he's, he may even think that he's lying to them in order to get what he needs out of them. But the words it's the words he uses to inspire that guy are the same words he used with Zach Afron to inspire him. You know, we hear those mm-hmm. words several times. So he's a master manipulator. Mm-hmm. You know, he knows what'll work. But in that scene with Ben Chaplin, they really do work. You feel the power of what he's saying mm-hmm. more than any other time he said it. Cause, and then you get to see Chaplin go out and uh, and do his speech. And as a side note, it's funny, Ben Chaplin, remember when he was like the it guy? He was going to be the next big star. After the Jimmy Giroff, uh, Truth About Cats and Dogs. Yeah, and yeah, he was going to be the next big star, and then, poof, I like him better as an actor now. <laughs> I was really impressed. Yeah. He really... And it's not an easy job. part. No. You know, it's not, he's... Not, not even likable, either. No. He's just a destroyed... Pre- and, it, and it really was great. And then, um, again, I'm going to have to depend on you for the name, the guy who played Joseph Cotton. Uh, Tupper. Yeah. Tupper. James Tupper. Again, here's where I think a little homework pays off, because if you don't know who Joseph Cotton is, he's just another actor in the company. But when, if you know who Cotton is, if you've seen his work in films, whether it's with Orson Welles or with Hitchcock, the minute this guy comes on stay, on screen, you're like, wow, Joseph Cotton. And then you learn a little bit about the guy, mm-hmm. you know, and what. And he's not a nice guy either, but in a different kind of way. And I'll just leave it at that. But I, the casting and his character, fascinating. Mm-hmm. Well, what I want to ask you is, is, so where do you think this this falls in terms of? Uh, um, you know, is it going to get recognition? Do you think it's Academy Award worthy, or is no. it just below it? Um, well, I, I was really impressed with Christian McVeigh's performance. I was impressed by it, but without anything else to weigh it against, he could just be a really good Austin Wells imitator. You know, and I think to get Academy recognition, you've either got to come up with something totally new and original, a character we've never seen before, or have something balanced out. So I said, you know, he was he was so a he gay hardware remember. salesman. You know, in his last movie, this time he's Orson Welles. I don't, I don't know what his range is. And without seeing that, you know, um, I can't. I just can't go for that. Me with a song. He may. It did occur to me that he may never. At the time, the future. This is so riveting and so, you know, in the realm. You know, may, if if next year we see Orson Welles in Kane, and then we see Orson Welles in Gala Wine, if he keeps re- doing remakes from different points and. You know, when he's the big fat Orson Welles sitting in the white tux, you know, drinking boxed wine on the beach, then we'll know. Yeah, yeah, ten, it's a 10 part show. <laughs> I can't think of anything else to say. That's okay, fine. we're wrapping ourselves up on this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you about tomorrow? No. Tomorrow's taken care of. One way or another. I was thinking about how you spent 30 years in a tiny cell and come out ready to forgive the people who put you there. Invictus, uh, Clint Eastwood's movie with Morgan Freeman and Matt Damon. And who'd have thought Matt Damon would be able to play a South African rugby player and get away with the accent? And he does. Mm -hmm. He pulls it off. He's convincing. I think there's this buildup where I'm watching the movie. I'm thinking, ah, I'm going to pay attention to his accent. If he slips, even for a moment, if he sounds like an American. And there are even, he didn't. There are even points in the movie where he slips into Africana. 
the native, <laughs> the native tongue. And you're like, huh? I didn't understand that because he's speaking a foreign language, not because he did. There the, must um, be something wrong in his head the way he's able to get into a character and just, just be it. I mean, it's just. It, He's got an actor disease or something like that. Yes, he has an acting <laughs> disease. You're right. But on the other hand, what did you think of Morgan Freeman as Nelson Mandela? It took a while for me to come around to it, mm-hmm. but um, I bought it. it. It took a while. Yeah. For a while it was just, you know, Morgan Freeman. But, um, you know, when you think about it, that was pretty great casting decision and I can see how Clint Eastwood would be like gung-ho to go ahead with it you know go ahead with it because uh, you know close with Morgan Freeman so that's something I was I was wondering when I saw the trailers on TV I was like eh, it sounds like Morgan Freeman just doing you know a bad imitation but once you get into the story mm-hmm. and it, you get to see a lot a lot of his performances the body English and mm-hmm. and the way he holds himself and the way he talks and the way he's Address, interacts with other people. A lot of that's in his performance. And that yeah. made me forget it was yeah. Morgan Freeman, which you need to do to make this story work. He was very great at reacting to things. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he was almost, um, uh, you know, like, like, kind of like a saint in a way that he was sort of pontificating to other people about how we should react and we should do this. But then, you know, nobody really has that experience of having been in prison for, geez, I don't know, since 20, 1965. Yeah. You know, when did this take place? 19- he was in. He was 95? in for. He or? was in for thirty years. No, but yeah, I think that's one of the things too. Is that and it's a good. I think the movie does a great point about this. Is that he was such a different kind of person, mm. especially in government, where people didn't know how to react to what he said. They were like, "Are you kidding? Or is this real? You want us to, to these guys yeah. were trying to arrest us right last man. year, mm-hmm. and now you want us to work with them?" And he's like, "It starts now." Forgiveness starts now. Working together starts now. That was all new. And he was right. It would have created a backlash of vengeance. Yeah. You know, it would have been like this playing on this, and people would have hated them, you know, if they had taken away the name of the soccer team. You know, and uh, what were the... Yeah, um, I guess we should, you know, start with a, a quick summary. So the movie begins with Morgan Freeman um, just being elected to as uh, president of, mm-hmm. South, of South Africa, and it was in the, the days prior. Uh, and it's basically him moving into his office for the first time and being just, you know, taken aback by all the, uh, the amenities and all the thing, all the, uh, you know, a, a very important moment in change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at that time. So it was very hard for him and the people he'd chosen to work with to uh, move forward. And um, their responses to the things that happen around them are pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. What I was going to say is that the movie is actually... Well, that's that's something. Um, on the downside, before we get to that, though, um, the whole thing about there's a rugby team, yeah. and it was always supported by the Afrikaners, and people, while, when apartheid was still going on, people would root against, would root for any team this other team was fa- facing against. This was the apartheid team, and the s- local sports um, organization. Uh, votes to change the name and the colors and the colors because they mean apartheid to these people but uh, Nelson Mandela says no if we take that away you're just going to alienate these uh, these people even more I am aware of your earlier vote I am aware that it was unanimous nonetheless I believe we should restore the Springboks. Restore their name, their emblem, and their colors immediately. Our enemy is no longer the Africana. They are our fellow South Africans, our partners in democracy. And they treasure Springbok rugby. If we take that away, we lose them. I know. All of the things they denied us. But this is no time to celebrate petty revenge. This is the time to build our nation. 
You elected me your leader. Let me lead you now. Really, it's like, you know, if you took away the Red Sox, you know, people would go nuts. If you if you took the Red Sox and, you know, the next governor after Patrick, Deval Patrick comes in and says, okay, they're no longer the Red Sox. They're, you know, the Boston Baked Beans. Mm -hmm. They'd be up. They'd be outraged. There'd be riots. And that's a, li that's a lighthearted example. This was life and death at the time. So he decides to, to not only keep the name, but the World Cup is being played in South Africa that later that year or a year's time. And he encourages the team, and Matt Damon, who plays the captain of the team, encourages them to do the best they can. And that's when, like you said, the movie starts to get really predictable. And it becomes a sports movie. Yeah, yeah, a, almost a cliche sports movie, which mm -hmm. is sad because there's a, there's a great sense of tension in the beginning of the movie where um, you really have no idea. It's those first few days in office, and you, you, work, you meet the security teams that work with keeping Mandela safe and just the things he has to go through because... Oh, the, the, the threat of assassination. Yeah, it's constantly there. Time. But then it gets lost. That that tension that makes the story yeah, that interesting the goes away. Yeah, because they were very concerned about him <coughs> being in public and even being at the stadium. And how it was interesting to see how a small team of guys was going to be able to prevent him from being assassinated or yeah, in anything, 60, anything. And uh, you know, here he is walking into a stadium that essentially I think you know was filled with people who did not support him. Right. Right. So it was like um, you know th there was that tension, and it did. You did, kind of did forget about that as you focused on the uh, on the on the football. But then again, maybe the, there was a parallel in that. That's what um, he wanted to do. He wanted the the people of South Africa to focus on the game because he was going to make them happy. He was going to give them something to. I'm sure that's what he wanted to. But I needed to see some conflict because it seems like everyone just joins in. Mm -hmm. He goes to the captain of this apartheid team and says, "Hey, I want you to win the cup for us and, and bring the country together." And the guy's like, "Yeah." Gosh darn it, we're going to do this. There's no tension there. None. Mm. I didn't, you know, a couple of the, the minor characters, you know, the, the players grumble a bit. And you knew that they were going to. Yeah, it was so obvious. And it I was, know history was, oh, shows us they, surprise. am I spoiling it? They win the cup? Historically, <laughs> they win the cup. <laughs> Believe me, if you don't know that going in. You haven't been to too many Probably movies. most of the world outside of America. <laughs> right, but the thing is, even though we know that's a foregone conclusion, I need to be kept, there needs to be suspense through the whole thing. There's just no suspense there. It was, yeah, just, it was I, really I frustrating. Understand. You know, the movie did do some things I like in the sense that it didn't teach people how to play rugby. It just kind mm -hmm. of was done through osmosis. You know, there's a couple of things like, uh, you know, you, you're supposed to, you know, you pass the ball. Back back, yeah, they go to it, teach it, kids at a camp. You score, scoring your points with the field goals. But it was really, you know, you got it through osmosis as opposed to using some sort of a scenario to teach the audience how to play the right. game. It wasn't about how to play the game. It was it was, it was, was the meaning of bringing everybody together over, around the game. And then how the team discovered the real meaning behind what they were doing. You know, when they took the boat out to the island to visit the cell. Robin's the, Island, yeah. Can we see the president's cell? Now, the, the number on the door, 46664, means he was the 466th prisoner to be interned here in 1964. He's done it up just the way it was. And they actually did film in that cell. Eastwood insisted that they hmm. they do the uh, scenes there, even, even, you know, even though it was so small. So, so it gave the team a sense of meaning, and then... Uh, People derive meaning from the team. And but don't you think that was a little heavy-handed, too? I mean, from... It was. You know, it just yeah. felt a little too much. It's like, okay, I know you got to give us a sense, you know, you've got to pass on a sense of what the man went through. Mm -hmm. But having the team go on a party boat to the island and walk around didn't do it for me. You know, I don't care how many... It was, but it, it was predictable. You knew yeah. that all this was going to happen, and I guess that's... It was a movie that was sort of going through the process of being a movie, just being a, a sports film. They found their reason for doing what they were going to do, and there wasn't any tr there's no tricks or anything. No. It's just getting it done. <clears throat> and there's a 
there's a really heavy handed bit of um during the final I think it's the final World Cup game involving a jet flying over the stadium mm-hmm. that feels so phony when it's happening. Like we're supposed to believe that there's real danger from this. You've and got it a just Black Sunday thing going Yeah, on exactly, exactly. <clears throat> Where I believe Black Sunday right up till the end. <laughs> this was this I I was like, this is ridiculous. You know? A if this had happened and I'm, you would have heard did. about it. Or maybe if it did, then I just can't. It it does, it shouldn't be in the movie anyway, even if it did happen. Because it just feels like, it's almost like they realized that they'd lost that sense of tension. Mm. You know, because we don't care about the game. Maybe if, again, if you knew a lot about rugby, you know, to me it was just guys game. tackling each other without pads. Which was... Yeah fine up to a point you know but then there are some brutish scenes i mean eastwood does capture the the uh that aspect of rugby you know being in on that yeah you know, it's just a, a mass of people i mean even the you know the the, the ball what did I, what did they say when they're about you know the the is that the scrum is that what they call it? the scrum when they're all like show their button heads but it's so funny because they say engage and i kept thinking of you know captain picard is that where he got it from was picard a rugby player but they go engage, and then these guys just interlock and push, and you know, sweat and grunt, and then, yeah, the game game footage was great, but, <laughs> but it was it was it was almost like cattle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the slow motion and stuff, it was. But you know, it, it is really is a finely made film. It's 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 done very well, and the soundtrack is terrific. You know, with the the African uh, yeah. choir and. Um, I think it all adds up to the it's again a that bit predict- of predictability. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. But the, and the thing again, it, it bugs me a little bit is that they really make you think that this rugby team was the most important thing of Mandela's early political career. I know he goes on a few uh, like economic junkets to China or Japan, and you know to meet people. There's a lot of handshaking and stuff. But for you know considering. And I'll admit, I, maybe I don't know enough about South African history to, to realize that, yes, this was the defining moment of bringing everyone together. But it's fucking rugby, mm. you know? I don't, I, yeah, everyone in the stadium must have loved it, but you saw all those townships and all those, those shacks and, and the then, poverty people that, were in, um, and this is all he the, did? The relationship outside the stadium with the cops and the, and the little black kids. Yeah, well, was, was that predictable? You know, that, yeah, that was pretty high. And then, so they, they again, spoiler alert, they win, and the movie ends. You get no sense that, you know, okay, well, that's it. You know? Mm. Nelson Mandela's job is done. <laughs> I just, um, yeah, it bothered me. I, it, again, very predict- predictable, entertaining, like Clint's movies, mm-hmm. you know, but... It's a nice thing. I wouldn't say it's like a crowning jewel for him. It's no, a, no. A, and I and I wondered if he was putting together some sort of a swan song film or something like that. I, you know, it really was the, the nicest so Nelson Mandela better. movie I've ever seen. Gosh, it's, it is. It's a feel good movie, but man, you want something. Yeah, some substance. It was like, okay, well, I, I think this was a movie of opportunity. But then I've listened In what to some of the interviews that well, they they could get Matt Damon for this. He knew that um, Morgan Freeman could do it, and schedule-wise, things worked out. And it was sort of like, well, you know, let's do it. I don't think it's something typically like it was. It's not a Warner Brothers film. They brought it to who was it? Summit. Yeah, I think or, so. Uh, I, I forget um, the name of the production company. It seemed. I. I. What I guess what I should say is I suspect it was a film of opportunity. So they were like, "What well, we can do this? We can do something really good here." Yeah. And we've got a window of opportunity to do it, so let's go for it. And they did do a good thing. You know, it's just that you know there really wasn't any real major surprise. Mm-hmm. But the audience, the preview audience, loved it. I mean, they were they were laughing and. There's tears being shed. It was, uh, it that was, was an you. emotional experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was you yeah. crying. Uh, well, I think that's, that's there, when you talk about a film of opportunity, I think that, you know, Clint has worked with Morgan Freeman a lot, and Morgan Freeman's talked about wanting to play Mandela for a long time. So I think that might have had something to do with too, saying, okay, mm-hmm. I can, I've got Morgan, I've got a script, I've got a window of opportunity, I've got Matt Damon, let's get it done now. Where I think if they had just 
taken a little more time, made it a little longer, or or dug a little deeper. Had, there had to be some other meaning besides a game. Right. And I'm sure that you know that's. I'm, I'm probably really uh, flattening things out. You know, obviously there is a greater meaning of uh, everybody feeling. You know, it's about people feeling better about themselves. That if only we had known that it could be done. Besides having, you know a game to base everything on. Well, and I wonder, too, if it was a game I knew more about, if this took place around the the Patriots' first Super Bowl win or the Red Sox' first World Series. If it had been a story set with that with that game as a background or something, not, you know, we need more than, you know, Bush in the office or whatever it was. You know, we, the Mandela story isn't there, obviously. But I wonder if there was a sport... And a culture of sport I knew more about that I'd get more out of this movie. Mm. And I also wonder if it's Clint's responsibility to give that to me because I didn't find it in the movie. Mm. Like you said, there's enough to let me know rugby is a violent game that um, involves kicking a ball and tackling Bugs. people. John, would you pay $10 to see Invictus? Yes, only because... I, I would always pay ten dollars to see a Clint Eastwood movie. I pay ten dollars to see Matt Damon, and I'd pay to see Morgan Freeman. I would too. So just for I that, for that, it's worth seeing. Just because I like watching what those guys come up with. Yeah, yeah, ten dollars. You're getting quality with this one. This is a quality film, no doubt about it. Just if only it weren't so predictable. But I would I'd definitely pay. Would you pay ten dollars to see me and Orson Welles? Mm, yes, but only because I'm uh, an Orson Welles. It's funny, I'm an Orson Welles fan, not his mm. movies, a fan of the man himself. And I think that mov a movie delivers on that level that, yes, I want to see it because of the guy's performance, bringing Orson yeah, Welles to life. Yeah, he is terrific, definitely. I would pay $10 to see this. And I'd also pay to see it because I know a lot of people who would like to see this. You know, there's, it, 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 it does appeal to an older generation. There were hell of a lot of older people sitting around me when I was watching it. Yeah. It, was, um, it definitely has that. And you like Zac Efron. And that too. For the record. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I introduced myself, my name is Ramon. But if I call me Rick, pardon me, but your accent uh, is funny, no? Oh, I'm a Cajun, bro. Born and bred in the bayou. Y'all must be new around here, huh? Actually, we are from a place uh, far, far away from this world. Go to bed. Y'all from Shreveport? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, we are people. Prince Charming here got himself turned into a frog by a witch doctor. Well, there you go. I'm going to make this short and sweet. I'm going to try to convince you to go see Walt Disney's The Princess and the Frog. I'm not either. It's old school Disney. It's... Get rid of all that 3D crap that every animated film's been coming out with. It's good storytelling. It's good songs. It's colorful. It reminded me, um, it's based on the story about the princess and the frog. You know, a uh, woman kisses a frog, turns into a handsome prince, lives happily ever after. Of course, that's a two-minute movie. This is uh, about a young girl who has a dream of opening a restaurant. Uh, there's a prince in town. This all is set in New Orleans. There's a prince in town who gets on the bad side of a, the shadow man who knows voodoo, turns him into a frog. He convinces her to give him a kiss, and the twist is she turns into a frog too. And then they go off and have frog-legged adventures in the swamp. Okay, maybe on that, based on that, maybe Musical you don't want to see it. Yeah, it's frog Rose. singing and dancing. There's a lightning bug. You know, there's, there's some voodoo stuff. It's set in New Orleans. It looks great. The songs aren't annoying. And I know what it's like to sit through a Disney movie and you go, oh, please stop is there singing. Is like a Disney Channel moment in the middle of this with one of the one songs? Of, or is it like a Disney Channel mu music video or something? Probably. Like they probably had all sorts of you know okay. Disney moments to sell this thing. Mm -hmm. But it was so much better than uh, lately. It, because of, you know, and again, a lot of it's this 3D crap is that there have been some really bad animated movies coming out. You know, they just because it's 3D. You know, oh, you got to go see it. Um, this is this is old school. This wasn't even digitally made. This was uh, really? hand drawn, <laughs> hand painted, old school Disney. It reminded me some of the um, the music's like from Doctor John. Really? Um, at least the opening okay. song is. That's a hook. Um, there's a lot of buzz because it's the first African American characters that Disney's had. I mean, she's an she's an African American 
princess, mm. which is a big deal, um, culturally speaking. It would have worked anyway. She, it's just very entertaining. Um, it's silly. You know, uh, there's a, an alligator who plays a trumpet. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can't defend that. You sold me. How about a little less picking and a... <gasps> No, I can't. I can't defend that, but it made me laugh. It's comic relief, you know? Um, and, you know, one of the characters dies, so it had that sad Disney moment we all look for. Now, since, you know, when uh, Blue died in the Jungle Book, killed me as a kid, kills me to this day. <laughs> I'm talking strictly from a fan base here. I thought it was one of the better animated films in a long time. Mm. It's tough to judge this year because Up came out, and Up's classic. Love that movie. And was um was uh, uh, Wally was that this year too? I was last year. I think. Last year, but those yeah. you know, but that's Pixar. Pixar has a habit of making amazing films. Disney hasn't done it lately. So and this I really, really should pay ten dollars to see Prince and the Frog. No, Princess you know why? It's it's no one wants to go see <laughs> Princess and the Frog at night. It's not a date Prince movie. Go on a Saturday matinee. Surround yourself with kids. You know, that's where oh, you should I see a movie like, like this. I know that. That's why you should do it. I know you hate kids in the theater. <laughs> in the theater. I, I said in the theater. But that's what will make it. You want to be around kids who are going to laugh every time the lightning bug lights his ass up. <laughs> because not only does it make it funnier, but it covers your laughter. Because I'm laughing too. And when you're sitting in the critic screening mm. and you're laughing at the lightning bug and no one else is, it's lonely. <laughs> it's lonely. I'll admit that. So I, would, I wouldn't say no. $10, no. Nighttime Saturday night date movie, never. Unless you're dating an animator or a child. Um, I would definitely, but Saturday matinee, you know, with kids, I would, that's why I'll go see it again. You got me. Note taken. <laughs> yeah, but not, <laughs> note taken, but not going. <laughs> I just think it's, it's just that entertaining. Disney That's magic. All, you know, is if it entertains you, then, yeah. you know, then it's... Did then I tell you the lightning bug's ass lights up? And he's toothless. He's uh, a toothless hillbilly lightning bug and his ass lights up. They should have that as a quote instead of like Ebert gives it a thumb up. Well, Say featuring a lightning bug with, a, with his ass lit up. John Black. That's damn lightning bug. <laughs> oh, that's a okay. keeper. Yeah, let's just keep <laughs> that wait, one. Wait, wait, wrap this up. Um, you can't top so, line. No, I can't. <laughs> no, just walk away. And that wraps up this episode of the Post Movie Podcast. We reviewed Invictus and Lynn Orson Welles. And I think John sold me on Princess and the Frog. I may. I may. And this has been John Black from Boston Event Guide. Oh, start that again. I think I talked over. This is John Black. This is John Black from... (laughs) I knew we shouldn't have had a sleepover. This is so cool. Are we going to play Mystery Date next, girls? (laughs) He's a dud. Put that in. (laughs) He's a dream date. This is John Black from Boston Event Guide. And this is Steve Head. This is John Black. And this is Steve Head. And this is the Post Movie Podcast signing off. Um, uh, Bye bye. (laughs) Yeah, they they can't hear you (laughs) wave, Steve. (laughs) (laughs) Waving bye bye is the car driving away. (laughs) We'll see you next time. I should have summed it up better. Like, oh, you know, we have an email. You know, if you have any questions, um, comments, yeah, concerns. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, money. Or, uh, we have an email address, John. We actually have it. It's it's postmovieshow at gmail dot com. So if you have any questions, concerns, or money, hmm. you can email us, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can get back to you. Yeah. Well, we'll actually, if you send us a good enough email, we'll read it on the air. Absolutely. <laughs>